Hello, 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 everyone. It's Tuesday, and that means it is time for Heirloom Afternoon. How are you doing today? It is a bright, sunny day here in the Chicagoland area. My name is Cheryl Muppin Sloboda, and I am uh, the host here of Heirloom Afternoon. Welcome, welcome. Uh, welcome to uh, my set. <laughs> and uh, and I am very excited to uh, talk about some really cool things with you. Uh, so if you are here live with me, uh, you are welcome to leave comments and I will ha happily answer as much questions and many questions as I can here on the show. Hello, Mary. How are you doing today? Um, it is... Uh, pretty exciting to start something brand new. And this is uh, something I've wanted to do for a little while now. Um, I have decided that um, my shows uh, that I've been doing on Friday night, so those of you that are following me for my Friday night videos, uh, you know uh, <laughs> the set looks a little bit different. The um, shows there on Muppin Sewing Emporium is really a lot about heirloom sewing and, uh, you know, more on that front. But here on Heirloom Afternoon, we are going to be doing more uh, deep dives on vintage sewing tools and how they work and why they work and uh, what they used to have to do or use back in the day uh, for, for, for our just general sewing pleasures, right? Because we didn't have, um, we have not had a lot of innovations in sewing, but we've got, we've also had a ton of innovations happening. So, um, a couple things I wanted to point out. You will be seeing a lot of my vintage quilts here on the set. Um, the one that's behind me here, this pink and white one, has these beautiful little adorable black work embroideries on them. This is a summer quilt. It's really more like a coverlet. It's not... Uh, it does not have any batting inside of it. It is just a front and a back that's been stitched together. It is hand quilted. Um, and I want to say that this is either from the 20s or the 30s. It's a fairly... Um, uh, these little designs repeat quite often throughout the uh, throughout the quilt. So, uh, for example, like the little elephants that you see, they are uh, multiple places. So, uh, Sue, uh, thank you for the love and the smiley. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Um, and so these quilts will be rotating. It will actually um, have a lot of these vintage quilts here on the show, um, and we will talk about them. But this particular one, you know, again, has um, a lot of um, hand stitching in it. And in the pink squares, and I know that's hard to see, um, but in the pink squares, there's really pretty uh, hand stitched design, but it is a summer quilt. It's about 80 by 70. It's, it's fairly big. Um, it is machine pieced. So we do know that, um, someone used a sewing machine to put it together, but it is hand quilted. Uh, it's in great condition, has a little bit of fading on it in a couple of places, but otherwise it's a great quilt. And, um, it is getting nicely aired out here. And of course we need to uh, constantly fold our quilts in different ways if we don't want uh, permanent creases to form in our quilts. These quilts over here, uh, don't worry, they will get their fair share and full attention down the road. Um, they'll all be uh, super on display. So <laughs> that is uh, the first thing that I wanted to talk about with uh, the the so-called, or well, not the so-called, but the actual heirlooms here on the set. Um, and so how is it that I wanted to, to visit this was both from a historic and um, 
and 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 more of a educational uh side of things but also you know sort of the weird and mysterious type things too um and i am using several books to help me along the way and i wanted to show you those books so that you get a sense of where some of this information is coming from and so that you know if you find something on the show that you really like that you could follow along with it now there's a wonderful group here on facebook uh that is about sewing and vintage um, tools, uh, needlework tools. It is run by the author of this book, uh, which is Antique American Needlework Tools. And this is by Dawn Cook Ronigen. And um, it is a wonderful and valuable tool to help identify, but also figure out what some of these needlework tools really are. So if you're ever... Um, in an antique store and you don't know what something is or if it's actually for sewing, these kinds of books can be really, really helpful to help you figure out exactly what that thing <laughs> really is. Um, now, this book is great because it does cover a lot of um, like things like needles and pins and pin cushions and beautiful full color uh, stuff in here. Um, I also really enjoy uh, taking a look at some of, you know, just some more of the unusual uh, things in both her and museum collection. So if you find this kind of stuff fascinating and you want to start a sewing tool collection, this book's going to be really invaluable to you. The only thing excuse me, that I can tell you about this, um, these books is they do not give you a price guide or a, uh, they're not really set up for pricing. Okay. So if you find something and you love it <laughs> and the price is right to you, um, then you should go ahead and get that thing. But um, if you are trying to take a look at your own collection and uh, put a value on it, um, these books don't provide that. Um, there are collector books for all sorts of different hobbies, like people who collect, um, well, I, just, I also collect very weird things. So <clears throat> if you were looking for uh pricing on uh let's say uh hair receivers or uh pie birds or any of those things there are books out there that will show you those particular tools those particular models those particular shapes and they'll assign a price or a price range to them my advice to you is if you are trying to go and get pricing on any of these things um, is to, you know, take a look first at eBay at a closed or, or actually sold items for something similar. So if you look at the, what is sold versus what the prices are going for now, you'll see what people are willing to pay for that item and not necessarily what people are willing to charge <laughs> for that item. So American, uh, Antique American Needlework Tools, this book is still available. Um, you can get it on uh, at your bookstores or Amazon. It is through Schiffer Publishing. Um, and it is uh, really, it's got like 750 color photographs. I think you'll really like this book. The other books that I am using, they're a little bit older. So you're going to have to find these in like the used book market. And this book I really enjoy. It is called Old Time Tools and Toys of Needlework. Um, now, it was very, um, this was a 1928 book that has been republished in the 70s by Dover Publishing. And if you know Dover Publishing, they 
uh, usually focus on things that are out of print or uh, are in the public domain, and they reprint those editions. This book is by uh, Gertrude Whiting, <laughs> and uh, Gertrude makes a good, um, uh, really a, a long history of books. Now, all of the pictures are in black and white. So that's, uh, first of all, that that's coming back from the, the 20s. Okay, so this book was reprinted from the 1920s. And I'm just going to use this picture here as an example. You do get very good photographs. But what it is giving you is the history of those items. So um, this book I got used, uh, I believe I got it on Amazon. And um, there are some pretty interesting uh, tool type things in here. Um, scissors, work baskets and boxes and things like that. Um, needles, needle cases, all about the pin. Um, the uh, bobbins, shuttles, things like that. So I'm not just going to be talking about quilting on this show. I really want to talk about a lot of different heirloom, uh, you know, tools, but also different sewing themes and methods. So you're going to see things like um, lace making and uh, tatting and things like that. Things that seem um, lost and, and we're actually going to be trying those things on the show. So I don't, uh, you may see me fail. You may see me succeed. Um, that's part of the whole thing here. I want to have this um, be uh, educational and a little experimental. So this particular book, Old Time Tools and Toys of Needlework, um, I always think of this photograph that they're using for the cover. You have Gertrude here. Uh, Gertrude Whiting is the author. I always think this is <laughs> this is her. Um, it is not her. <laughs> There's no photo of Gertrude in the book. Um, but they do talk about things like spinning and uh, all sorts of different things. And I just really would like to talk about a lot of different things on the show. So old time tools and toys of needlework going to be uh, something that we will pull from on the show. And the last book <laughs> that I am using is The History of Needlework Tools and Accessories. Uh, this is by Sylvia Groves. Uh, this book is also extremely um uh, useful. And the reason um, this book I, I enjoy quite a bit, and I believe that this book was published in 1966 originally, but this uh, version was reprinted in 1973. Um, you kind of have a little of the same uh, things that are covered, and then the photos again are in black and white. Um, however, um, this particular book does give you, uh, again, more of the history of things, which I find really, really fascinating. And, um, you know, uh, a lot of how to do some of the things here. Uh, and I just find some of this really, um, really educational. And so uh, if you're interested in tambour, in um, hairpin lace, all those things. We're going to be talking about that on the show. Um, and so <laughs> just to give you these, uh, these different um, resources for you to also continue your own education on all of these in on your own if you like. Um, so if you're at all fascinated by the history of things and how they work, that's what we're going to be doing on this show. <laughs> so, uh, my friends, welcome uh, again. And uh, I can't wait to get started. For those of you that are curious, uh, this show is going to be Tuesdays at 12 p.m. Central. Uh, and we are plan <laughs> to do them every Tuesday 
unless something unforeseen happens. And this show is live, which means we're doing this show uh, off the cuff, no script, no nothing. We will have some special guests um, along the way, but we are uh, definitely not planning to, it's not a pre-recorded show. You may be watching this afterwards, <laughs> but it is not uh, pre-recorded. We are doing all of this live and in person here. And so, um, yeah, <laughs> it's definitely a little bit different uh, from what I'm used to. So uh, I'm going to bring in uh, my camera here so we can show you what uh, one of the first things is on the show that we're going to be talking about. And that is, um, you know, something we all have in our homes. And surprisingly, they're not covered in any, not one, single one of these books. So uh, we have had to do some uh, some more uh, learning, education, etc. You can hear it. It's very heavy. Uh, let's bring it up and put it in the stream. Nope, I want it the other way. There we go. <laughs> okay, my friends, it's an iron. Uh, and this is, um, well, it, it, we use these, uh, and, and, and I think the reason they're not in these books is because it's not a needlework specific item, but any one of us who sews, we use irons. We use them all the time. And you probably aren't as fascinated with the history of irons as I currently am. And, uh, and, and here's uh, <laughs> what I have been finding out. So when you look up or when you see an antique iron like this in the uh, thrift shop, in the antique store, or what have you, you're gonna see these called sad irons, okay? And that is not because they're like, oh, look at that poor sad iron. Um, I actually had to look that up. Why do they call them sad irons? And the reason they call them sad irons is because the word sad uh, is derived from the word solid. So when you see a <clears throat> the term sad iron, you really mean uh, a solid iron. And in this case, a solid iron iron. And the word iron comes from, <coughs> excuse me, the fact that it was made out of iron. So it is, uh, it is what it says on the tin as my, British friends like to say, excuse me, <clears throat> uh, it's very dry in the house. So that's, that's what we're getting today. All right. So the sad iron. Now this is a very small edition of a sad iron and this is a child's iron. So everyone in the home back in uh in, in the time in in the older generations and and in in over history everyone in the family contributed to the household in many ways and these smaller irons were developed because the larger ones which i will bring a version over here to show you in <laughs> size difference okay so this is a uh, sad iron. And I'm going to talk about this type of sad iron here. And then here is the smaller child iron. Now, a child probably couldn't lift this, um, but a child could lift and use this. And so many times they're confused to be um, salesman samples. And if you, if it was a salesman sample, um, it would actually uh, either have a lot of branding on it. It would have a lot more information on it. 
Um, most of the times the salesman samples, they actually, um, you know, uh, would have other companion pieces with it. So this is more than likely not a salesman sample. It is more likely that it is a child's iron um, and not a toy. Okay. This is actually meant for a child to be using it and actually helping mom, helping grandma, helping whoever uh, actually iron uh, things at in the home. Now, <clears throat> how did they heat these? Uh, and, and, and this is very, where it gets very interesting. An iron like this was quite literally put in your fireplace if you, before uh, stoves were uh, invented, they were quite literally <laughs> uh, put uh, in the fire uh, to get heated up and then uh, the soot would be wiped from them and then they would be used on the cloth. Uh, Mary, you're absolutely right. Hey kids, <clears throat> come handle this burning hot piece of metal. Absolutely. Uh, you know, um, this entire iron would be scalding hot, burning hot. Um, <laughs> and it would be absolutely true that they would have to uh, use like a, uh, a cloth or a mitt of some kind in order to grab this and, and, and start using it. And of course, if you were putting it in an actual fireplace, you know, it would actually um, collect all of the burning uh, uh, ash and things like that all over it. So you would actually have to uh, set it aside, wipe it down. It might even be too hot for your fabric. It could actually scorch your fabric if it's too hot. So um, this crude iron, you can see uh, that it has gotten a couple of repairs to it over the years. So this was, um, you know, that as well. Bridget, you're absolutely right. Uh, they would also use this to uh, iron their hair. Now, many women in olden days, they would have extremely long hair. Um, they would use them on hair and actually have vintage hair uh, curling irons to show you on another episode. So I will, I will talk about that. Uh, down the road because there's some really interesting inventions that came out of the ironing process. So this whole piece, right, is metal. So putting it in an actual uh, fire would, would absolutely make this metal uh, handle extremely hot. So... <laughs> Mary, I started ironing when I was nine or 10, but then we had plug-in irons instead of these. And absolutely, uh, <clears throat> the, the iron, um, you know, we all learn as kids, you know, the stove is hot, uh, don't go near the fireplace, things like that. Well, these kids, you know, they had a, a much uh, different upbringing than we did. Now you could see how small this little iron is it's very um very tiny and i do, i want to say it's about four four and a quarter inches long so it's not very big at all but these were how uh the the irons were made um they did have more of a flat end uh this uh oblong shape didn't come into play until the mid uh, to late 1800s. So this, that means we can date this iron to about the mid to late 1800s. Um, again, it would be uh, placed in your stove. Your pot belly stove was the typical place that you would set your irons. Um, your stove would be running usually all day. You would uh, heat up your stove in the morning and you would uh, get your, uh, your, your irons nice and hot after you've cooked your breakfast or even during while you're cooking your breakfast. And then these would be ready for you to use after they've heated up.
So you're thinking like, well, this seems like pretty terrible to be able to like go and grab this uh, whole metal thing and this hot, hot iron uh, seems like a pretty uh, <laughs> not so innovative thing. And that is where a different iron came into play. Um, and <laughs> uh, I think you're going to find this pretty uh, entertaining because if there's a woman um, who created a new iron and, uh, and she... <laughs> She created a different kind of iron, and this iron you're going to enjoy, I think. Uh, it is this type of iron, and this iron. Now, this is a this is a full-size iron. This probably weighs uh, 10, maybe 10, 10 or so pounds. Um, it's got a nice, flat surface. It's got some rust on it. That's because it's made of iron. <laughs> Now this iron has a rather ingenious handle. Uh, this was, first of all, uh, we can thank uh, a woman for this design uh, because uh, this particular handle here uh, removes, and there we go, okay? So this handle removes and you have this heavy brick-like thing okay, would sit on your stove. And this handle could then be attached to the iron in a quick release way and then be able to pick it up. So this was a way to save your hands from being burned. Um, it was a way to switch out to a hot iron <clears throat> whenever you needed to. So women would have multiples of these irons going. And you can imagine that after a period of time on the stove and you take it off of the stove, that this would cool down really quickly. And then you, how would you continue to iron your clothes? Well, you would have to put this back on your stove, wait for it to heat back up and try this all over again. This is um, fresh from uh, the the uh, the thrift shop, <clears throat> still full of dust. But you get the idea here that what women would do was have multiple of these bases and then they would put on the handle, pick it up and start ironing. And can we just say that one, <laughs> right? Like Bridget, you are so right. Leave it to be a woman to invent this. Um, and here's the other thing that she invented. She invented this football shape. So this football shape means that you can iron pointing in either direction. We think of the typical iron nowadays where it has that one flat end so that it can sit up. She does not care about that. She wants to be able to pu push her ironing in both directions. And so that pointed football shape is her other uh, patented design. So not only did she patent uh, this handle system, which trust me, is really, really cool. So you can see here, there's a little wooden um, uh, spring like action thing going on here. And that just snaps right into here and away you go. So this iron uh, handle can be used with multiple bases and <clears throat> those multiple bases then can be heating on your iron stand or on your stove and you can then just pick up a different iron when this base cools off switch to the new hot iron now again we're also 
these ladies are trying not to scorch not just their hands, but their fabric as well. So they want these to be hot, but not too hot. <laughs> so that um, has to be a very, uh, you know, you have to be very clever. You have to, to have a lot of sense of when the iron is too hot and when it's uh, hot, you know, just enough. And so they would test it to, to know whether or not, and a lot of times they would also have uh, a, a piece of test cloth, especially too, um, your, your stove is going to have, you know, a uh, dirt or, or grease or anything on it. And if you're pressing something uh, delicate or very uh, important, you're going to want to make sure <clears throat> that you uh, take care of that. These irons had other inventions as well. What they would do is instead of this being a solid brick, which this one is very solid, they would later put other materials inside the iron so that the outside would get hot, stay hot, but would be less... Um, damaging to us and also lessen the weight of this. And so you will see irons that say that they have asbestos in them. <laughs> they will actually say on the actual iron, asbestos iron, and they have inside, uh, they will have asbestos in them uh, in order to keep the weight down um and you know these women they had to have had some pretty strong arms to constantly lift this and push this back and forth on their fabric it was this is one of the cases that we forget as new uh in in our newer eras we forget that <clears throat> Pressing and ironing are two different things. When you press something, right, you're just lifting the iron and putting, and the weight of the iron does the work. So that's a press. Ironing is when you are pushing the iron back and forth, and you are, in some cases, stretching that material, flattening that material. Ironing is very different from pressing. But the women who came before us, they had irons that were incredibly heavy. They were 10 pounds, 15 pounds in some cases. So these irons were quite, quite heavy and they were quite um, difficult <laughs> to maneuver. So this particular iron, um, again, called a sad iron, not because it's sad that we had to use them, <laughs> but the word sad, comes from the fact that it is solid. It is solid iron, um, the, the heaviness of the iron, solid iron, sad iron. So a lot of times when you're looking for these or if you wanna collect these, they're gonna have that in the title and the name, um, they'll be called sad irons. <laughs> so um, think about the chambermaids and the freed slaves that were still but server, ser servants and house service, that's all they did all day long. Bridget, you're absolutely right. Um, this was really, really difficult work to use heavy, heavy irons like these. And even that is why um, the child irons do exist. It's because everyone had to participate and... Um, you know, the, the younger people would be part of that. They would have to uh, also help and, uh, and, and iron as well. So none of these, no one could escape <laughs> the iron. Now, of course, as having um, uh, people in your home to help you uh, fell out of service or fell out of favor and women were left on their own, you started to see these innovations coming into play because, you know, husbands were like, oh, my my wife can't iron my clothes because she burned her hand. Well, let's get her an iron that uh, makes it easier for her to do that. And that's where 
these irons with the removable handles came into play. So these are uh, pretty darn innovative for uh, ironing and putting them on your potbelly stove or what have you. But it actually, uh, they did uh, make other inventions as well. Um, and <laughs> here's a, a pretty interesting one. Uh, this one is another kind of iron. Uh, I would say, I you know, date wise, I can't say that this is a particular uh, from a particular date, but we know that this is once again probably a child or or even just a smaller uh, one that would be used in the home. But this has a, a little wooden toggle here that you would open, and this is for coal. So you would take a uh, hot coal from your stove, put that in here, let your iron heat up, and then be able to use it. So um, again, you can see the, uh, the more traditional iron shape here on the bottom. And there's a lot of venting here um, for your heat to escape uh, because what they realized was if you put something really hot in here <clears throat> and you did not uh, give that uh, heat someplace to expand, well, guess what happens to these? They, they explode. So <laughs> uh, lots of venting. You'll see usually some uh, decorative cutouts along the edge here. Um, the handles, uh, sometimes they have been replaced. Uh, there will be like wood, uh, a wood wrap around this edge here. There's still like the wooden uh, knob here so that you can uh, open and close this without burning your fingers. Um, there's a lot of rust in this one. Uh, maybe a cobweb down there too. <laughs> but this is definitely... Uh, not a little decorative iron. This is not a little like pretend iron. This is a coal iron. And you would put hot coal inside of here and you would use this uh, then back and forth on your, on your fabric. Um, you would not want to uh, tip this or set it up on its edge uh, because then the coal bits uh, would roll around in here. And um, we are actually, so here's, here's something that's going to happen on next week's show. We're actually going to heat these irons up and we are going to try them out. So next week, you're going to see us heat uh, these two irons up. We're going to heat them up and we're going to actually use them on an ironing surface and try uh, that on some fabric and see what happens. See if we can see if we can recreate that. During the summertime, we'll do uh, this one. This one, we're going to try it with charcoal briquettes. So uh, all of these, uh, before you cry, uh, oh my gosh, you're you're going to ruin your antique. Um, my goal is to put them back into use. See how they work and uh and all of that so if you're interested you're gonna have to follow along especially next week when we fire up no pun intended <laughs> no pun intended uh we're gonna fire up uh these irons and see how they work on fabric so um again uh this particular one is a coal iron and you would put hot coal briquettes. You would basically get them with tongs out of your potbelly stove. Um, if you had a coal stove, you would drop them in here and then you would go ahead and continue on with your day. Um, I actually have a pretty decorative one uh, that I have uh, that is also another coal iron. Again, um, this one is made of brass. And you can see yet again, you've got all of those decorative teeth. This one is missing the uh, latch here that would keep it shut. So this really is more 
of a decorative piece for me. Um, I wouldn't be putting this one into uh, service. It's pretty gr uh, grungy uh, it can, and you know, it has been used as an iron. It's got a wooden handle and you can see how nice and smooth uh, the bottom of these irons are. Again, the typical iron shape. All of this was before electricity and electric irons did come into play uh, at the end of the 1800s, like 1890. There's a lot of cobwebs in this one. <laughs> um, but you get this sense. This is the bigger of the two. You can see the size difference here between these two. They're pretty, uh, pretty pretty big. This one is pretty big. Um, so this would require more coal. This one would require less. Uh, but I feel like um, these would be a lot of fun to get some charcoal briquettes, light them and see if we can get uh, these irons up and operating and uh, pressing some fabric, just like they did in the old days. Um, so, um, but again, you have this area here for the heat to uh, escape. I think that women would still need some sort of like uh, hand protection. So they probably would wrap their hand with a towel or something uh, just so that if what was coming out of the iron was extremely hot, they would be able to... Um, still protect their hands so but again uh pretty neat stuff uh, i think i spent look i spent twenty dollars on this iron <laughs> so uh these don't uh they're not a, a very expensive collectible um this one this small child iron uh when i picked it up it was in a section of other irons and it was called a doorstop and I think many of us have used uh, old sad irons as doorstops <laughs> in our uh, sewing rooms, in our homes or whatever. Um, they made great doorstops because once the iron became like a real thing, uh, you know. So here uh, is a more, I guess you would call it a more modern iron uh, that does have a, uh, an electric handle. And um, I paid $10 for this iron. And here's the little label. So you can see 10 bucks. Uh, I haven't plugged it in yet. That's going to be next week. We're going to test this iron out. We're going to test a bunch of them out. And um, this one is called a travel iron. And um, I believe that you can pull this out, but I haven't tried yet. So let's see if we can. Um, I think the cord, yeah, see that cord comes out of there. And so, uh, otherwise this is just a, look at how thin it is. It's still really heavy. Uh, my friends, um, 10 bucks is what I spent on this. Now here down at the bottom, it is called the durable folding travel iron from the Winstead hardware manufacturing company in Winstead, Connecticut, USA. And uh, it has a patent number. So somebody patented this. Uh, so all of that is down here on the bottom. This is called a folding travel iron. Where does it fold? I do not know because um, it's certainly not folding here. Although, oh, I see. So there's a little latch here. Let's see if I can get that one. It seems to be stuck shut. It's very dirty. Um, I'm going to see if I can get that to uh, open. But this looks like it may like fold down. And then you would, um, of course, then just plug this back in. Uh, and then it would heat your, heat your iron. So we have not tried this one yet. Uh, and so we will try this one on next week's show as well. Um, uh, you can see very well loved, very well used. Um, I think these are really cool. Uh, they've definitely got, uh, a lot of character, some of them a lot more than others. I just felt like, I don't think even our modern irons are this thin <laughs> ladies. I think it's, uh, we're it's about a half an inch thick that's not very thick at all um and so 
For a modern iron, uh, there are coils in here uh, that once they receive electricity, they get hot. So that is uh, the typical modern iron, including the irons that we use today. Uh, this one uh, was considered a travel version. The cord doesn't seem to be very long, but you know, it's got one of these uh, scary unpolarized plugs. So, you know, uh, that ought to be fun. And next week when we uh, fire up all of these irons, I know that Charlie uh, will be here. He's going to have our safety protection uh, stuff. And so we're going to, we're going to test them out, but we're going to actually try and do that and be very safe. So, um, again, this little antique iron I got at a thrift shop for 10 bucks. And, uh, I just thought it was a really cool addition to my, um, my collection. Now I could go and I could research, uh, when this patent was, um, offered and I can look up this company, uh, and it has its little catalog number here as well. So I could look all of that up and see um, when this came out. But it does have like, if you can see here, like this latch and this latch does something here. It does keep it um, from twisting or turning. Um, and... I am, I'm pushing on it pretty hard and it's not, it's not budging, but it is a little bit corroded in there. Um, Mary says, uh, I like how sleek it is. It's a pretty, uh, sleek thing. Uh, this would have been a very space age looking iron for a lady who may have only ever been used to this. Uh, so it is definitely a, um, uh, quite the difference in technology, but also, um, you know, this, this plugs into your electricity and this, of course you could still, and, and these were used all the way until the 1950s. So these types of irons, these sad irons, when you see them, sometimes they are fairly clean on the bottom because, they had been used uh, by people who didn't have electricity, by people who were in rural areas and didn't have access to these, um, these fancier uh, technologies. And so I feel like, um, you know, that let the sad iron stay in our collective consciousness uh for a long time uh mary uh hey honey we're going on vacation and i got you this so you can still iron my clothes yeah the the folding travel iron uh yeah it's <laughs> i don't i would not say that this was um you know uh i don't know like what i mean as a as a as a person would i uh want this as a gift um you know you have to remember times were very different and um women's magazines and things like that would show men purchasing and buying uh appliances for for women uh as as gifts in order to make their household duties easier that's where those crazy ads for washing machines and and uh, all sorts of other things come in. And that's because when you're talking about, um, you know, those domestic chores, and I feel like the reason the iron is left out of these fantastic books about needlework and accessories it's because this was more of a domestic item, not for your fine handwork, your fine needlework. It wasn't necessarily for that. It was more, uh, you know, everyone had to wash their clothes. Everyone hung their, usually hung their clothes to dry. And that meant inevitably you had wrinkly clothes that absolutely needed to be ironed if you were going to go out into society. So every woman owned an iron. Um, and I feel like that's why we're not, we don't consider the iron part of our needlework tools. 
we think of it more as um, a you know domestic chore type uh, item than than needlework item. But I don't know a single sewist who doesn't have to use an iron. And I know we don't think about where these irons uh, came from as far as our, you know, in our collective consciousness and in our collective, um, you know, in our collective sewing rooms, we, we, how many people, and I am one of them, I haven't ironed my actual clothes for years and years. I think the last thing I actually ironed clothing wise was on my wedding day for my husband's shirt. That's quite literally the last thing that I ironed with my iron. Uh, for the most part, clothing has come so far that it's perfectly unwrinkled when it comes out of the dryer. Um, the modern dryer has obviously helped uh, relegate the iron to less of a domestic tool uh, and more of a sewing or a, a rare accessory. There are plenty of young people who don't own an iron and certainly uh, don't have any need to. Um, if they need their clothes pressed, they you can always take it to your local cleaners, and, and you know they can press and and clean and press your shirts. So I think that you know we've come a long way from irons being full. Uh, fully made of iron uh, to these these really cool hybrid models, uh, you know, where they are wood and uh, and metal. And then uh, even on to an iron like this, this is obviously before plastic. I mean, it has plastic. Um, so, you know, we can look into when this one came about. It does have a UL rating. So... It'll, that'll help date it. Um, so yeah, I, I, you know, friends, this is really cool stuff. And, you know, again, um, these now um, are great sewing room decor. <laughs> I can't wait to fire these up next week and see uh, how they run. Um, and, and I just, I just think this is so darn cool. Um, it's just so space. It's like space age, but not. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure if we take our modern irons and gave them to uh, a woman in the olden days, I'm sure she'd be like, what in the heck is that? How inconvenient uh, when the iron can do so much more of the work uh, like this one. And I just, you know, the, this thing is incredibly heavy. Uh, so no wonder they've been used as doorstops since uh because of course you know uh this one probably was a nice luxury these older ones you can find pretty much everywhere and crude as they are uh they've been you know around since the beginning of time so uh as long as there have been clothes to be pressed uh, there have been uh, big, heavy irons like these to press them. So, uh, but I just find it uh, amazing that a woman is the one that came up with this football shape uh, because she wanted to be, be able to press in both directions. <laughs> uh, so yeah, that's super awesome. Uh, if you have any questions please uh, go ahead and drop them in the comments and I'll do my best to answer them uh, either on this video or in a future video. And if I don't know the answer, I will absolutely tell you that I don't because I don't claim to be uh, an expert. I am uh, just very, very interested and fascinated in the history of these things. And I just find this uh, so, so, so cool. Um, and uh, and so next week, uh, we're going to be heating these up. We're going to be pressing some fabric with them. And I think <laughs> it's going to be uh, a pretty awesome uh, experiment. Uh, is it, it probably will also be super dangerous. I'm going to have to find, uh, you know, an oven mitt. 
<laughs> that I don't mind sacrificing to this project. Um, it's also uh, going to be pretty cool to see how uh, the invention here works too. This woman's uh, uh, amazing patented design. Um, and again, if you had multiple bases, uh, these should fit uh, on all of those bases and you'll be able to just swap swap out the base for a new fresh iron. I think that's really cool. <laughs> um, and then, of course, during the summertime, uh, we'll take a look at these. Um, it's a little too cold out here for, for me uh, to fire up a grill full of charcoal. Um, so we'll do that <laughs> on a different episode, but we are going to try this one as well. Now, the inventions didn't stop here uh, from coal. Uh, they actually went all the way into uh, the uh, gasoline, kerosene, all kinds of things were used to fuel primitive irons. And uh, we, we have some of those examples as well that we will also try. Um, so don't worry, uh, we're not done. Don't worry if you're worried uh, that this isn't uh, your bag. <laughs> it's going to be uh, pretty cool to also uh, go through this same type of history with all sorts of other uh, needlework things, needles, pins, uh, you name it. Uh, April, uh, fascinating. I love how technology is involved. Absolutely. I feel that this is such a strange look at how... Um, the evolution of the iron, the simple iron that we all use and have in our homes. And we have uh, been trying to, uh, you know, innovate. There's not been a lot of innovation, including the shape. Um, to this day, your iron is shaped probably in this uh, format or, or in this one. Um, you can still get a football shaped iron out there. Notice no steam holes. We still, uh, any steam was uh, applied to the, the fabric either uh, by, by flicking water on it or um, uh, by ironing wet or damp clothing. Um, so no steam evolved just yet. So <laughs> I hope that you have uh, rather enjoyed this look. And I think that next week it's going to get even crazier when, uh, when we heat these up and we actually try them. And, um, I can't wait. Of course, uh, it's a live show, so it goes how it goes. Experimental. That's what I kind of like about it. You get to come along for the ride. And so thank you so much for joining us. Don't forget that you're going to want to come back every Tuesday at 12 noon central time uh, for this, uh, for Heirloom Afternoon. And you can find all of our heirloom sewing tools and more in our website uh, at shop.muppin.com. Uh, we have smocking and all sorts of fabric manipulation tools and uh, patterns and all sorts of fun things there. So if you haven't checked it out, you should. Uh, Mary says she had fun. I appreciate you guys coming along on this ride with me uh, for our very first episode of Heirloom Afternoon. Thank you. Have a wonderful afternoon, and I will see all of you next week. Take care. Bye-bye.